Welcome everyone. I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Father Stephen, our chaplain for the Catholic Daughters of the America's Court, Ave Maria. Um, he's going to give us a presentation to help us prepare for Lent. And it's good timing because then we can take advantage of the adoration that there, that's ongoing over in the chapel. So Father's talk is Forgiveness of Biblical Proportions. Father. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll pray in a second. <laughs> I like to walk around, so I'll be walking around. Well, I can't. Uh, it worked. The microphone works really well. If I'm too loud, let me know too. I um, uh, I wanted to start with a video. It's, it's not going to show on here because I'm not as technologically advanced as I thought. But how many of you have seen the movie Inside Out? Okay, so I want to explain the concept to you because it's pretty. It's pretty clever. So you can see up there, the main character is a girl, and this is a trip inside her mind. So each of these little characters, as you can see on the far left, that's anger. Uh, the one in green is disgust. The one in the middle is joy. Uh, the one that's in purple is fear. And then the one on the far right is sadness. And it's really interesting that the way that they try to depict what's going on in somebody's mind during the life experiences. So it's a teenage girl who moves to um, California, I think, and it's her first day of school, and she has a really bad day, first day of school. You know, nobody sits with her at lunch, she cries in front of her class, I mean, it's like the perfect storm, right? And there's this whole moment where there's a trip inside her head at the dinner table that night. And if you've seen the movie, it's pretty funny. I mean, you can watch it yourself, but there's this awkward silence where you can tell something's wrong. You know, like when you've seen your kids when you know they had a bad day, but, and, and what they try to depict, it makes fun of them, but there's some truth to it, is that the, the wife is staring across at the husband, giving him the eye to like, say something, you know? Like, the nod, like are you there? And uh, so th there's this blank stare, and the people in his head said, sir, she's looking at us. And then, and then he, he gives him the nod again. He's like, quick, do something. You know, like, so how was your day? And she just like rolls her eyes at her husband. And he was watching like a hockey game in his head the whole time. And it, it's funny. So watch it when you get a chance. It's a great movie, though, because it shows how you, you can't selectively numb your emotions. And so um, I'm mentioning that today because these little characters, although they're in a Pixar movie, uh, our emotions are very real. Um, they are not to be ignored. And that has so much to do with how we handle things important like forgiveness. So before we start tonight, um, I want you to keep that image in the back of your mind. And let's just say a little prayer. And I want to tell you a story. And just as an overview too, um, I'm going to be talking about four main things. I'll probably talk for 45 minutes. Sorry, that's a little longer than I planned. But hopefully it'll be good. So, the first would be, an overview would be, why forgive? The sorts of forgiveness. Reasons why we don't forgive. And then how to forgive. So I want this to be practical, to end kind of on a practical note. And if you're worried about taking everything down and getting all the notes down, I'm recording this talk right now on my iPhone. So the audio should be available. Uh, and hopefully we can get that out to the parish after tonight. So, with that said, let's pray, okay? And if you'll please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Just take a moment to place yourself in God's presence. With an image here of Jesus and his sacred heart. Lord, we just ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us to open up us up to whatever you have for us tonight. We thank you, Lord, that we're here. We thank you that we could spend this time together. We thank you, Lord, that you are always seeking us, that you left heaven to come to us, and that your whole mission was a mission of forgiveness and reconciliation. And I just pray for an outpouring of your grace upon every person in this room tonight, that their hearts would be open to whatever you have, for them, for their families, for their loved ones, for their friends, for those who have hurt them, for those who need to forgive and to be forgiven. We pray, Lord, that you would pour out your mercy 
tonight in a new way. And we pray that any distractions, anything that is not of you may be kept out of this room, away from us. Help us to focus and to listen to your voice speaking to us tonight. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You can be seated. So I told a story at Mass a couple weeks ago, if you heard, that my homily was kind of a practice of sorts for this talk, and I told a story about this guy. This is a true story, by the way. I heard this in Philadelphia. And this guy uh, took an, an outing one day. A story about a man, a backpack, and his boat. So a man went out on his boat. He had his backpack with him. In his backpack, he had all his valuable belongings, cell phone, keys, wallet, lottery tickets, you know, and, and he was having a great day fishing, and then things started to go south because he did not notice that down the river from him, there were some rapids, small ones. The Schuylkill River doesn't have very many rapids, but enough to throw you off if, you don't, if you're not ready for them. So he was, everything was going great, and then he hit these couple rapids. Before he knew it, his boat was teetering and tottering and filled with water, and he knew he was going down. So in a last-ditch last, last ditch effort, he reached behind him and grabbed his backpack. So his boat's going down river. In one hand, he's trying to hang on to his boat. In his other hand, he's trying to hang on to his backpack. And it gets to the point where he realizes, well, that boat's gone. So he lets the boat go. It goes down the river. And now he's hanging on to his backpack because that's the only thing left, really, that he's got security in. Wallet, keys, Powerball tickets, all that. And his backpack starts to fill with water. And if you ever carried something underwater, it, it weighs you down pretty easily. So now he's trying to get to the shore, but the current has carried him in, into the middle, and his backpack is weighing him down, and he realizes that if he lets go, he might live. If he doesn't let go, he might not live. And he finally comes to his senses, and he lets go, and that backpack goes to the bottom of the Schuylkill River. Who knows what's down there? And it is gone. And he survives, and he finds himself, you know, without wallet, keys, phone, all of that. I'll circle back up around to that story, but, you know, the, the image is strong, because we all have a backpack. <laughs> and you know what your backpack's full of. I know what my backpack's full of. Things that we hang on to. And it's a great image when we talk about forgiveness, because there are things that we hang on to in life, and, and we try our best to kind of float through life without drowning uh, from whatever is pulling us down, but that backpack really does weigh us down at times. I want to keep that image in your head. So it kind of brings me to my first point. We are talking about forgiveness of biblical proportions. That's the name of this talk tonight. And my first point is just why forgive? Why forgive? There are three main reasons I think why. I mean, these are my reasons. The first is a theological reason, so I'm going to start with the nerdy stuff. Okay, so uh, it's called original sin, concupiscence. We are born into a fallen world. We wound each other. We hurt each other. We have this tendency to sin that we all carry with us. And the world is not good at coaching us against that. Right? The world says, hate your enemies, get back at those who hurt you, curse back at those who curse at us, in the car, on the highway, always get the last word in, judge others, hold on to grudges, all those things. A couple weeks ago, I was at a Carolina Hurricanes game with Father Scott, and I was just people watching, because that's a good place that people watch, and there was a couple in front of us, and then a couple over to the left, and as this new couple came in, there, this whole argument broke out over whose seats were whose. And it was just kind of dramatic. And, you know, of course, the guy's trying to be all territorial, like, those are my seats. You know, he's like, well, check your tickets. And then this whole thing unfolded in front of us, and it was, it was just childish at the end of the day. I mean, they were sending people back and across the row just to make sure they bumped into them on the way out to get their next drink. And, you know, it just so clearly represented how we, we just like to get revenge at people sometimes. And it could be in silly ways, but it's true. We, we have that as part of our fallen nature. And yet, in a world that trains us not to forgive, we all need somebody to forgive. 
Jesus comes along teaching, like we heard two weeks ago in the gospel, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who persecute you, who mistreat you, stop judging, stop condemning, forgive and you will be forgiven. And I think we can take that for granted. That is radically, radically different from the message that the world tells us. When you go to work on a given day, that is usually not the way the world operates. It's really radical. So there's the theological reason. Here's the practical reason. Unforgiveness is not good for us. It's not good for us. I mean, it affects our whole person. It's not good for us emotionally. It's not good for us psychologically, mentally, physically. It like weighs you down. You can be tense. So we're going to do a, a, you thought you were going to get away with not having any group participation, but that's not going to happen. So I, I'm going to ask for some courageous and maybe some extroverts in the crowd to uh, help me here. And um, what I'm going to do, it, it's actually something that's used in marriage counseling, we're not doing that right now, trust me. I'm not qualified for that. Um, but it's called sculpting. And similar to the image of, from that uh, movie that I was pointing out, what it does is it helps us to think relationally as opposed to just thinking logically. So what I'm going to have are like eight volunteers come up. And then um, I'm going to ask any uh, men who are in the room, I need God, the, I need the Trinity, I need Mary. So I'm going to need a Mary, and then I'm going to need eight people to represent different emotions and we'll call them spirits that can kind of become obstacles for us, okay? So um, can I have three men in the room come up uh, to represent Trinity? And that's not me trying to be sexist. It's just God the Father, God the Son, and then we have a room full of women, so you guys get to fill all the other roles. <laughs> so, all right. Um, William, can you be God the Son, you're Jesus, okay? Wow. And you could be God the Father, okay? And then I need a Holy Spirit. Perfect. Thank you. So um, what I want you guys to, and this is a great place actually, is to stay here and uh, remember the, the love between the Father and the Son is so strong. It's a person. It's the Holy Spirit. So uh, as uncomfortable, this might be a little uncomfortable, but it's important. I want you try to represent like the love of the Holy Trinity, the Father relating to the Son and the Holy Spirit being a part of that. So you guys can figure that out. Well, I'm going to go over here and grab some more volunteers. But think on it for a second. Okay, I need Mother Mary. And um, Karen, I was going to pick on you because I know you love the Blessed Virgin Mary. I do. Yes, I know you do. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> so, okay. So Mary always kind of takes the back seat, right? She's so humble. So I just want you to wait um, until your time comes. Mary would do that, Okay. Um, I need a very brave soul who's willing to be the person that's experiencing these things. Anyone? Any takers? The person who's experiencing this mix of emotions I'm about to name. Okay. Thank you. Come on up, Trisha. Thank you. Okay, Trisha. I am going to... Um, let's put you right here, Trisha. Okay? Right in front of me. Okay? And we're about to get into a big mess because <laughs> these things I'm going to name... You know, they're, they're very real for us. Maybe they don't all coexist in us, but they're serious things. And so um, I will just ask for seven, sorry, eight, eight more people to come up. I know that's a lot, but uh, can I have eight hands and whoever's willing? Yes, come on up, please. I'm going to give you a piece of paper that kind of represents uh, an emotion or a spiritual state, okay? Yours is confusion. Okay. <laughs> these are, I'm not picking you to be assigned to these personally. These are just, you're going to represent how confusion would sort of manifest itself visually to, to Trisha right now. So you can, and if you need help, I'll help you with this, okay? Um, okay, yours is hopelessness, right? So how would hopelessness kind of, and remember, we're thinking in relation to the Holy Trinity and Trisha. How is hopelessness maybe blocking the way, or confusion, or rejection, or powerlessness? And if you need some suggestions, I wrote down a couple. Um, this one is fear, okay? Fear. And then I just need two more. Two more? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Rita. Uh, unforgiveness, right? That one is important for today. And then shame. Nobody, sh Nobody wants to be shame. I get that. 
Thank you. You guys are brave. Okay. And then the last one is abandonment. Abandonment, right? That's a big one. But um, I, I'll play abandonment just to kind of play into this because that's one that's just kind of pretty tender. So um, I want to give you just a minute. And remember, Trisha here, we're trying, not Trisha herself, but the individual who's experiencing some of these things, what are they experiencing in their mind, in their spirit, in their heart that's keeping them from intimacy with God, the Holy Trinity? Okay, so if you had something that came to your mind, like for example, when I did this on a retreat, hopelessness was blocking her vision from the Trinity, right? That's kind of what I'm thinking. And then, you know, rejection had a very strong alliance with me, abandonment, to make sure that nothing gets in this inner circle of things that are blocking her from God, right? And I know it just got really serious. <laughs> this is really important though, and I wanted to stick with you because this is what's happening in us. And it's so complex. Uh, so I'll give you a couple suggestions, but you guys want to take 30 seconds and kind of maybe arrange yourself around Trisha in a way that you might think you'd manifest her in relation, right? These are evil things, right? Deprivations of the good that are preventing her from being in communion with God. So take 30 seconds and try to maybe position yourself in a way that kind of represents what you're trying to depict. And if you need some suggestions, I've got some. Um, and while you're doing your thing, I'm going to read off just some that came up when we were doing this on retreat. Hopelessness was blocking that person's vision. Abandonment, was that's my part. I'm the constant reminder from the other side that you weren't accepted in some way, right? And I'm kind of always voicing that across. And I've got a very strong alliance with rejection to remind her to chime in when it's time, right? Uh, fear, for instance, might be time... Her hands are blocking her, right, from getting close to God. Shame might be pushing her away from God and telling her that she's not worthy, right? So if you go ahead and move into place, if you, it's okay to get a little closer. We sit next to each other all the time in the pews, so. All right, powerlessness sometimes was guarding their escape, right? You can't get out of this. Um, Rejection, like I said, an alliance with abandonment to keep them from getting close with anyone. And unforgiveness of all that was weighing them down. So, is it okay if they so in some way put a hand on you? Okay. Maybe her love, love language is physical touch. <laughs> okay. All right. Take one minute and just try to get in position. And don't forget, the Holy Trinity is facing them, right? And so these guys... Like William is ready to go, the Father is ready to send him in, right? And the Father has that authoritative but but watchfulness over Tricia, and the Holy Spirit is working with them both, right? Okay, so um, are you guys ready? I'm just going to kind of go through one by one, and you can tell me your own thoughts on your relationship with Tricia right now. So are you ready? This is not easy, by the way. Uh, we did this on a retreat with a bunch of men, and it was pretty uncomfortable, but it's really important. Yeah, maybe just describing your sort of interaction with her. So it doesn't have to be in words, but like, what are you doing to her, in a sense? Yeah. You probably saw it shaking her head and looking down. No, she's facing in, not out to the Trinity. So kind of like closing her mouth, keeping her from speaking, almost keeping her words from coming out, stifling, paralyzing, kind of. And um, mine's mine's hopelessness, and I'm, I, it would be like you said, just not letting her see it, just blocking everything's in shadow, still emptiness. And then she's exactly right in between her and the Trinity. I've got powerlessness. Powerlessness, and I would say to guard her from or block her from going and keeping her out of control. Very good, very good. Confusion. Confusion is going to keep her from being able to hear things that will help her clarify, maybe help her from seeing things, maybe hearing too much, just a little bit, all over the place. Uh, just um, try to make her small and feel rejected. Um, and because it's already blocked, I'm 
continue to block but make her small at the same time? Um, unforgiveness. I would just go, <laughs> just give her some nasty looks. And as abandonment, you know, that's the feeling of just being left alone and somebody didn't come to help, right? Helplessness, really. So I have a very strong alliance with some of these things. And I can move around throughout somebody's life and just remind them at different times. You know? But what happens, this is the beautiful part. What happens when Jesus comes into this picture, right? Well, everything changes, right? When I pray, you know, say Trisha is praying with me and we're doing a kind of prayer that's using the holy name of Jesus to submit these things, these spirits, these emotions at times to the authority of Jesus Christ. If I say in the name of Jesus, I renounce abandonment. Like any partnership I've had in my life with being abandoned, well, where do I go? To the one under whom every knee bends. I kneel here now before the Trinity. I have no power. Right? If I say in the name of Jesus, I renounce and I break any bonds, lies, or ties with, you know, hopelessness. Hopelessness comes to me and bows before the Trinity. You don't have to bow, but you can stand over here. All right? And then fear, same thing. In the name of Jesus, I renounce fear. It doesn't have power over me anymore. In the name of Jesus, I renounce confusion. Well, now I'm starting to hear God's voice all of a sudden. <laughs> Things are becoming a little clearer. Um... In the name of Jesus, I renounce shame, right? In the name of Jesus, I renounce, what was yours? Rejection, right? Now, all of these are kneeling before the power of the Holy Trinity, and now this space is opened up, but one thing that can cling sometimes is that unforgiveness. So we wanna send unforgiveness under the authority of God. In the name of Jesus, I renounce unforgiveness, okay? See, it's not that God wasn't trying to reach out before, but it's that there was obstacles in the way of it. And what forgiveness does, especially, is it clears, just clears the obstacles. And then Mary comes, as she always does, so tenderly, behind the scenes. She knows everything that's happening, and she does what Mary does. What does Mary do? No, not the evil spirits. <laughs> yeah, well, those are, those are, yeah, emotions and spirits, but Mary always brings us to Jesus, right? There we go, <laughs> right? And then she can come. So you can bring her to Jesus, right? So thank you. You guys are so brave. But let's just enjoy this for a moment because finally she's brought back into communion, right? The communion. And Mary had a big part of it. Using the authority of Jesus Christ had a big thing to do with it. So thank you guys for being so brave and doing that. I know that wasn't comfortable, but... It's nice to hear the word to say. You know, by the power of Jesus Christ, I renounce all this stuff. Yeah, the name of Jesus is a prayer that brings his presence. So thank you guys so much for doing that. You can sit down. So, yeah, deep stuff. But now you have an image in your mind of what's going on spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, in, in somebody's mind, body, heart, spirit, of, of things that they might carry within their whole life. They don't even know how complex it is that's going on. So if that made you feel uncomfortable, it's very normal. If it made you feel vulnerable or exposed, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just, it's just, actually, we were talking about this earlier in the office as I was brainstorming this. And, you know, we almost more easily relate to each other in this broken kind of state than pretending like we have it all together, right? Because that's all of us. Some, one of those things we've dealt with at some point in our life. But here's the thing about forgiveness. This is St. Vincent de Paul. To pardon an injustice received is to heal the wound in our own heart. Forgiveness has everything to do with healing, right? So if we're about forgiveness of biblical proportions, then we're about healing of biblical proportions. That's when the Gospels really start to come alive for you personally, is when you experience what Jesus can do that was kind of represented there through that activity. I said that there were three reasons. That's a practical but also a spiritual reason. Unforgiveness is, is not good for us spiritually because like we represented, it blocks us from receiving God's grace, God's love. 
And forgiveness removes the blockages. Healing is tied to forgiveness. Forgiveness itself is healing. It's good for us emotionally. It's good for us psychologically. It's good for us physically. We don't feel tense, tightened up, weighed down. And spiritually, it's good for us. So let's talk about the source of forgiveness. And we've hit on it already. But I think it's helpful to say, what do we mean by forgiveness and mercy? Because that can be a little abstract at times. It's hard to give words to at times. Well, forgiveness is not. Let's go there first. Forgiveness is not false humility. It's not being walked all over. Sometimes we Christians can mistake that. Like, you just got to be nice to everyone. Forgiveness is not putting yourself back in harm's way. That's important, too. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. It's a really important distinction. Because reconciliation always goes two ways. Forgiveness, it's kind of more one way. It's what I can do in response. Sometimes reconciliation might not always be possible because the other person isn't willing. Or it might not even be safe. Sometimes it's just not entirely necessary because it might be a very small harm that we're pardoning somebody from. We don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting the offense or dismissing the damage done. It's not forgiveness. What they did matters. It doesn't mean pretending that injustice hasn't taken place or that another has a cause of suffering. It doesn't mean saying, it's okay. Which we sometimes do when somebody offends us. Is, it's okay. Don't sweat it. It's probably better if we say the words, I forgive you. Because what that says is what you did really matters. And now I'm not going to hold it against you. That's how God treats us in our sinfulness. The source of forgiveness is the cross. That's where God's forgiveness was unleashed upon humanity. Remember what Jesus said from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Forgiveness is undeserved love. That's what forgiveness and mercy have to do with undeserved love, a love that might not be deserved. And when that undeserved love is received, we call it mercy. When that undeserved love is given, we call it forgiveness. That's why the word give is in the middle of forgiveness. When the undeserved love is given, we're kind of Dismissing, not dismissing, we're forgiving a certain debt that has been incurred, right? Use a financial language. What's the Bible teach about forgiveness? I mean, the, the entire Bible is the story of God's forgiveness of humankind. Christianity, it's the message of God's forgiveness. Think of Joseph in the Old Testament, betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery put into Egypt, and he rises up to the top, and the day comes when his brothers are in need, and they're starving and famine, and they show up on his doorstep asking for help, and eventually he forgives them. And a great blessing comes into their life. Forgiveness is all over the Gospels. It's a huge portion of Jesus' teaching. Think of the Beatitude of mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Some of Jesus' parables are pretty strong, and one of them is the parable of the unforgiving servant who is forgiven an enormous sum, and then won't even forgive the person that owes him just a little bit. And he has a very severe punishment because of that. The gospel from two weeks ago that I mentioned earlier, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, forgive and you will be forgiven. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Every week at Mass, we pray the Our Father Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I love St. Peter. He is such a good knucklehead. <laughs> Lord, how often must I forgive? Seven times? Is that enough? Seven times? And Jesus says to him, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven, or 77 times. Now, if you know an extra detail, it brings a lot to the picture. Because in the Bible, 
seven is the number of completion, the number of fulfillment. So Jesus is saying, forgive until it's complete. Forgive until the forgiveness is full. That means forgiveness isn't just a one-time event, it's a whole process. It takes time. There are layers, and that's okay. The Lord knows the timing of the heart better than anyone. In confession, the power of the cross is unleashed upon the penitent when the priest prays in the person of Jesus God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, death and resurrection, has reconciled the world to himself, reconciliation, for the forgiveness of sins. So, now I just want to get into the final part, and that's where we start to get a little practical, because that's talking about the reasons we don't forgive. So, obstacles to forgiveness. And we all have them. One is, I just don't want to. Or, it's too hard. It's just not possible. One that's tricky is because I want to maintain a position of superiority over another. I'm right, they're wrong. I'm the saint, they're the sinner. I mean, if we're really honest with ourselves, sometimes that's a struggle. Sometimes it's because their sin is useful to me. Their wrongdoing to me is useful to me because I can use it against them to manipulate them. It happens. Sometimes it's a complete lack of awareness that we need to forgive. Sometimes it's because the harm has been minimized, the harm that's been done to us. We've, we've just minimized it rather than face the pain that it's caused us. Sometimes we've buried our hurts just so deep that we've forgotten about them. Out of sight, out of mind. The problem is, and this is true for each of us, is when that happens, things get buried alive. And they stay there kind of undealt with or not fully dealt with. And it's like that backpack in the river that's just kind of weighing you down. Sometimes you go through all of it, not really knowing how weighed down you are because there are things that have happened decades ago that we just we've hung on to or maybe forgotten about. Maybe because they're so painful. And I, I really want to say that with compassion because for somebody who hears confessions, I hear a lot of things that just are unimaginably horrible that other people have done to each other. And, and I say that with compassion because some of those places, you're just so hard to go. You don't even know how to approach it. It's just like this enormous thing that's, I don't even know if I'm going to deal with that, right? So if you feel that way, it's understandable. But some of that stuff gets buried alive. Sometimes we think we've already forgiven someone. Uh, we say forgive and forget and that really forgiveness is un incomplete. Sometimes, and again, I say this with compassion, that people have become people can become used to being the victim, and it becomes their identity. And to let go of the victimhood means well, it's very scary because it means letting go of something that they've formed their whole life around. And that's why any form of forgiveness, that if it's scary for you, because you're afraid of it, then confronting it and letting something go is extremely courageous. It's extremely courageous. You know, one of the people who wrote a book that we're using for Lenten study groups is Sister Miriam James Highland. And she has this incredible story, and I'm not going to go into it, but I went on a retreat with her recently, and she always said, when you were talking about these things, try to approach them with curiosity and kindness, right? We don't have to beat ourselves up about our past. Curiosity, non-judgmental, kindness. Because Jesus is always kind. You know, when Jesus comes into this dynamic, he doesn't force his way in. He just waits until we feel safe enough for him to do his work. Because that's what love does. Jesus is the most disarming person to lay your in front of. Just, he listens. 
And then he waits until we've stopped fighting. Until we've moved through anger, which is an important emotion to experience. And then we come to a point of surrender. And he can do what only he can do. Okay. Let's get a little practical. I think uh, an important question to have answered by the end of the day today is, how do you forgive? And there's no one answer, but I think it's important to acknowledge that when I say forgiveness of biblical proportions, I really mean it, because what it means is we're asking for something that's completely beyond us. We don't have the power in ourselves to forgive some of the things that have been done to us. Forgiveness is a grace from God. It's something God-like. I think one of the most beautiful paragraphs in the entire catechism is this one. It is not in our power not to feel or to forget an offense, but the heart that offers itself to the Holy Spirit turns injury into compassion and purifies the memory and transforming, transforming the hurt into intercession. That is extremely powerful. What, do we, what happens to us if we open our heart to this? God can literally change an injury into a form of compassion for another person's brokenness that they've just unleashed upon us because of their own mess in their life. And that compassion literally will change our memory. I was reading a book earlier, and I put this quote on the back of a handout you're going to get. And this is the way that this author describes that kind of healing. The healing goes back into time and transforms the very moment when you are hurt into a moment of grace. The very wound that was the cause of so much suffering is transformed into a blessing. And all the bitterness it caused is changed into meaningful and fruitful suffering. Our memory becomes healthy to the extent that we surrender our past to God and know that it is more His past than ours. That's what God can do when we enter into this process of forgiveness. And He can transform our even our painful memories. Think of Jesus' wounds. This is the best example I can think of. I asked my theology professor, why was it that Jesus, when he rose from the dead, rose with his wounds? He said, because they're the signs of his victory. You ever think about that? The wounds are the place they tried to hurt him, kill him, and he kept them. Because they're glorified wounds when he's risen from the dead. And when Jesus unleashes the power of the resurrection into your life and into your wounds, he glorifies Wounds, and he makes what were once places of brokenness into places of healing. First for you, not just for you, for, for, for other broken hearts, for other broken souls. That's powerful. That's why meditating on the sacred heart of Jesus is a great place to make contact with God in your brokenness. Because when you give him your heart, he does to your heart what happened to his own. It's been pierced, but he can redeem that pierced heart into a heart that becomes a full of life, full of divine life, transformed. Some people say, well, I still feel angry. It's one of those emotions that was the red guy up in the Inside Out movie, and he heats up. And I just want to say this. Anger, if it's the feeling of displeasure resulting from injury, mistreatment, or opposition, caused by response to injury? The key question is always, what did you do with your anger? See, anger is not always sinful. Sometimes we make anger into a sin when it's not. It always has to do with when it leads to revenge or when we act upon it, that it becomes sinful. And often, unforgiveness is the main culprit behind anger. But forgiveness... It's, forgiveness is, is, we'll put it this way, forgiveness can still be compatible with continuing to feel hurt 
and or the feeling of resentment, which we usually can't control, right? Those are emotions that we haven't given our will over to as soon as we experience them. But the big question is, are you willing to forgive? Because forgiveness is an act of the will. It's not just a feeling. You might not feel like forgiving, but if you're willing to, because forgiveness is an act of the will, God can work with that. What happens to somebody when you show them forgiveness? This is from Dostoevsky. He says, There are souls which in their limitation blame the whole world, but subdue such a soul with mercy and show it love, and it will cure its past. He says, You will inflict the most awful punishment that could be imagined upon them, and at the same time save their soul and regenerate them. You will overwhelm them with your mercy. They will tremble and say, How can I endure this mercy? How can I endure so much love? Am I worthy of it? That heart will bow before your mercy. It thirsts for it. It will melt before it. I was talking to somebody in the sacristy after Mass today, and they told me a story about forgiveness and how the person that did them the most harm in their life, they were able to get to a point where they just, they just melted them with mercy. <laughs> I was at the hospital on Saturday, ran into a guy, went up to visit with him and his wife, and on the way up he said, Father, I listened to the homily from two weeks ago, and it brought up some stuff for me. And he said, I haven't talked to my brother in three years, and I called him last week. And I said, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. And I said, thank you for being so courageous and for putting into action what is so hard. How do we do this? The long and short of it is that it's, it's, God's going to do it through you. When we call on the name of Jesus, He forgives through us. We like to unleash His power to forgive through us. When we ask Jesus to do it for us, we do it in the strength of His name. I didn't mention how that story ends. Some of you know because you were at Mass a couple weeks ago when I told it. But that guy who was on the Schuylkill River, whatever nastiness he was floating through at that point, he got to a point where he had let go of his backpack, wallet, keys, lottery tickets, all that, in the bottom of the Schuylkill River. He found himself at a bar later that day. I don't know how he got in without an ID, but he was having a drink at the bar. And things were going pretty bad for him. The guy next to him says, you look pretty depressed. What happened? And he told him the whole story. And this is a true story, by the way. He said, well, I happen to be a certified scuba diver. I'm not kidding. Let's go get your backpack. So they go down to the Google, got his backpack back, got his wallet back, got his keys back, got his cell phone back, got his Powerball tickets back. They were a little soggy, maybe a little expired. My point is that forgiveness is restorative. It restores us. It heals us. It mends what is broken. Because that's what God can do when we just give him a little space. You can continue the conversation with Jesus, because I probably pried into your heart tonight. I'm not going to apologize for that, but know that he wants to tend to that heart more than anything.